Hello and welcome to the In For A Penny podcast. I'm Mark Schoffman, a freelance personal finance journalist, and I'm joined by my financial planner friend, Joshua Gersler, who runs an advisory business called The Orchard Practice. Hello. If you'd like to know a little bit more about us, you can check me out at www.cavendishcontent.com and Josh at www.topfs.co.uk. Each episode, we aim to give our perspective on the world of finance and money, and discuss some of the issues that crop up in business as well as everyday life. We hope that you'll learn something from our podcast as well as have some fun too. So this is episode four of our protection series. Yeah, you you look dubious. I'm sure this is episode this four. This is episode, so let, what have we talked about so far? We've covered the different types of protection, the application process, some of the protection terms you'll come across. And yes, this is episode four. And on this episode, we are going to discuss business protection. Yes, so this is very useful for business owners and also employees of businesses, which is probably most people. Everyone's an employee, unless you're on your own business, then you're not. So, Mark, what's the most valuable asset to any business? I'm going to say the staff. Correct. It's people. People. Not the computers. No. Your high-end max. Carry on. So without people, a yeah. business's survival can be at serious risk. So business protection is a way to protect a business. Makes sense. Does yeah. exactly what it says on the tin. Okay. So there are a few main types of business protection. Sure. There's shareholder protection. There's key person cover. And there's relevant life cover. So those are three types of business protection Mm -hmm. that we'll talk about today so the first shareholder or partner protection so i'm guessing this is if you run your own business you are going to need to protect those people who've invested in it and i guess yourself as a director not quite okay okay so shareholder protection or partnership protection can help business owners keep control of their company if one of the owners dies or is seriously ill critically ill Okay, so I'll give you an example. Okay. Let's take a business run by two friends. Can we call it Schoffman and Gersler? Schoffman and Gersler. What do we do? What are we selling? Dreams, mate. Dreams. Okay. I think there's a company called Dreams. I'm I'm pleased that you've named it after us because what happens is one one of the the owners dies. (gasps) Okay. We won't say who. Let's say it's uh, Gersler because I don't want you to get upset. Thank you. I'll be upset if you died. Okay. Yeah, so Gersler dies. Okay. (laughs) What happens to his shares? So... Mo- mo- the majority of the time, hmm. those shares would go to his family. Right. So if he's married, they yeah. go to his wife. What if I don't want to work with your wife? Aha, uh-huh. you've hit the nail on yeah. the head there. She's so a lovely where, person and everything, but... That's where shareholder protection can come in. So what usually happens is both of the shareholders or the partners, or however many there are, take out an insurance policy on their life. So if one of them dies, the proceeds of the life insurance policy go to the other partner, so you Shoffman in this yeah. example, and Shoffman therefore has the money to buy the shares from Gersler's wife. What if she doesn't want to sell them to me? Also a very good question. So they usually these type of policies are usually set up with a cross option agreement. So that means that a uh, agreement is put in pl- place that says upon death the either the surviving partner of the business or the surviving spouse can force the other person to do the deal. So if one of them wants to do it, it happens. So if if you want her to carry on in the business and she wants to carry on in the business, then you just carry on like that. But nine times out of ten, people don't want that to happen. And so one of you has the right to force the sale to go ahead. I say force as, as if it's a bad thing, but it's not because it's all done at a fair market value. Who decides the market value? So you do when you set up the insurance policy. So there's different ways you can value a business. You could do it based on the net profit of the business. You could do it based on the assets in the business. You could look at the liabilities. You could look at price earnings ratios. There's lots of different ways to value business. The important thing to note is there is no legal requirement to do it in a certain way. But everyone would, everyone would want to make sure it's fair for all parties involved. But who, who value Is it the insurer valuing it? Or? No, you, do, you, you choose when you set up the insurance policy how much you want that to be for. What if you're dead... And then the value of the business has changed. I can't answer that. I'm dead. What if, what if your wife <laughs> thinks the shares are worth more? If you set up the cross-option agreement, there's nothing you can do about it. So you have to be careful and be sensible when you do set up the policy. You can put in their uh, growth 
in the value. You can put inflation linking. It could go the other way around. So the value of the business has gone right down and you're paying well over the odds for it. Yeah, I don't want to do that. Well, that's just the, the luck of the draw, really. The key is that the valuation is one part of it. The key is that you get to retain control of your business. So who pays the premiums on this policy? So normally the individuals take out a policy on their own life or you could take out the policy on each other if there's just two of you and you pay it yourselves. If you pay it, you can pay it as a business. Um, there's certain accounting treatment of that. We won't go into the accounting of it today. Okay. Do I have to pay tax on the money I'm going to receive or the shares? The proceeds from the insurance policy are free of tax as long as it's set up correctly. Okay. What you need to consider is if when selling your shares, they're potentially liable to capital gains tax. So it's probably best to speak to an accountant? I would suggest so. So that's shareholder protection at a high level. Have you heard of something called relevant life cover? I've heard of life cover. Relevant life cover allows employers to provide death in service benefit to their employees in a very tax efficient manner. This is very popular with small business owners. Okay. So the employer takes out the insurance policy and it's written on the life of the employee. So if it was Shoffman and Gerstle Limited, yep. Shoffman's an employee, the business takes out the policy on Shoffman's life. Right. Okay. So the business pays the premiums. Now that premium is a business expense, a legitimate business expense. Okay. Therefore, it brings your profits down. Mm -hmm. It don't look so concerned. Bringing your profits down means you pay less corporation tax. Why do you need relevant life cover? If you refer to an earlier episode, we spoke about why you need life insurance or, may, or why you may want life insurance. Mm. So for those people that want it and have a small business, this is the tax efficient way to set it up. If you paid the premiums out of your own bank account rather than the businesses, so you've taken the money out of your business mm -hmm. and then paid the premium. Yeah. Okay. So if you've taken £100 out of your business, you then pay income tax on that money. Yep. And to make numbers simple, let's assume that you pay 40% tax on the £100. So you've got £60 in your bank account. You with me? I am. Okay, you're looking worried. No. Is it when we get a bit bit uh, numerical? A little bit. You, you start to glaze over. Yeah. So you've t you've paid £100 out of your business, you've paid £40 of that to the government, £60 has ended up in your bank account. Yep. If the premium for this life insurance policy is £60 and you're paying it personally, it's in effect cost you £100 to do so. Yeah. Yeah? Mm -hmm. If you pay that £60 out of the business, it costs you even less than £60 because you're saving the corporation tax. So if your corporation tax is... 19 percent mm. that's 11 pound 40 so in effect only costing you 48 49 pounds can you see the difference there yeah so you can only do this if your company offers it correct so that so the business pays it yeah there's but, no tax as a benefit in kind or anything no that's the other good thing about it it's not treated as a benefit in kind and the proceeds of the policy are also free of tax and they go to whoever you set up in the trust so Mr. Shoffman, in our, our example, might pay it to Mrs. Shoffman or whoever else you choose. And can those rates be cheaper than if you've arranged it yourself? What do you mean? The premiums. Is there a difference in the premium? If you did a life policy as opposed to a relevant life policy. Yeah. No, the actual premiums are usually the same. Okay. Okay. It's just what's wrapped around it that, that determines the net premium. Because mm. a lot of... Um, Companies have death and service benefits separate to relevant life cover, don't they? Yes, they do. But that's something different. Yeah, that's a group death in service scheme. Okay. And maybe we'll talk about that in another episode. Okay. I can see how a relevant life policy would be good if you're a small business, because you, particularly if you're, if you're running your own business as a limited company, because then you can reduce your corporation tax. Is it cheaper if you're running your own business to set this up compared with doing it in your own name? Yeah, we've just said it's going to cost you £48 rather than £100. What happens if you leave a company though that's offering this? So most insurers will give you the option upon termination of your employment to carry on the policy in your own name. So then you would just pay whatever the regular 
premium is, the £60. Pounds. And so this would be different, though, to a whole-of-life policy? Correct. A whole-of-life policy is a policy that runs forever. The relevant life policy will have an end date, usually the link to your retirement age. Okay. And I think the third type of cover that we spoke about was key person cover. Right, it used to be called locks- key man cover. Okay, not Nowadays, for locksmiths. No, not those type of keys. So key person cover, which could be life insurance or critical illness, is usually taken out by a business on an important member of the team. How do you define who's important? Completely up to the business. Yeah. So obviously you wouldn't count as important. Okay. But it depends on the business. So Good it provides a podcast. Pardon? Good luck editing your podcast. <laughs> it provides a financial safety net if a key member of the team dies or is critically ill. So the company's taken out the policy and the proceeds from the claim are paid to the company. So let's take Shoffman and Gersa Limited. And Shoffman really is a key member of the team. Yep. Okay. He edits the podcast religiously every week. Okay. In a, in a synagogue and everything. It's, the rabbi's not very happy about it. No, but he does it like <laughs> that. Oy vey, get out of my synagogue. <laughs> um, if Shoffman is critically ill and can't work, mm. we're going to struggle as a business, aren't, aren't we? we? Yeah. We need someone to edit that podcast for us. Yeah. So if we had a policy that paid out an amount of money, if you were critically ill, we could pay a real expert to edit it whilst you were off. And they wouldn't even need to do it in the synagogue. (laughs) Okay? So, I know we put it in a jokey context, but in some businesses, it is a big thing. You might have a key salesperson or a key admin person that if they're not there, the business would struggle. Or it might be the founder if they're not there to keep everything together. So what this policy does, it takes away that hassle. So the business pays the premiums for that? Correct. So there's certain reasons you might think about taking it out. It might be to cover the cost of recruiting someone else. It might be to pay for a temp. It might be to cover the loss of profits whilst that person is off. It might be to pay fines and penalties for things being late. It could be to pay sick pay to the person that's not there. So there's lots of reasons you may want to do it. Would you not have another policy to pay sick pay? You probably would. You probably would. If you were having everything, yeah. you'd have a group income protection policy. We're not talking about group no. policy today, but you're absolutely right, Mark. Is there um, How do you decide how much to claim? Well, if you, you what you would do is you think about those disasters that we've discussed, whether it be loss of profits, paying for a temp, how much you would need, and you take out the policy accordingly. So the cost to edit our podcast must be enormous, the amount of time and effort you put into it. Yeah, just so to we, clear, I don't get paid. So we so let's say that is a job for someone and it's full time and it costs twenty five thousand pounds a year. Yeah. You might take out a policy that pays twenty five thousand pounds a year. Or you might say, Well, I'm just going to need the cover for one year, I'll just get it to pay me a one off twenty five thousand pounds. So is a premium linked to however much cover? So the more cover you take, the higher your premium. Correct, exactly. Like with all insurance policies. Like with all insurance policies. Is there any tax on that payout? Yes, there is. If the business is paying the premiums and benefiting from having that as a business expense and therefore paying less corporation tax, then any claim that's made is treated as income from the business and liable to corporation tax by the business. But business protection, it's not exciting, it's not sexy, but these are things that can save people's businesses, can change people's lives. It's disaster mitigation. And I guess succession planning as well, if you're thinking about the future. Yeah, go on. Why don't you expand on that a bit? Well, if you, particularly I guess if you run a small business and you you want to know that it's going to be looked after when you're gone. So you might have a business partner who's got a child who's, I don't know, a bit of a rebel, a bit of a rogue, and you don't want to have to deal with them if that partner passes away or is ill and they're the only family member left you don't want to have to deal with this I don't know it's not your nose teenager in your office so you, with um, I guess shareholder protection you'd have something in place where you can keep control of your business yeah exactly yeah do you think it's do you think this is more beneficial for small businesses uh, no I think all businesses should have some sort of business protection can it stop a business going bust yeah it can indeed if a key member of the team is off and the business can't operate, it's going to go under. Having this payout 
is going to save the business. Obviously, this will cost a business money, but is there a, one particular type that they should prioritise? No, they need to sit down by themselves as a, as a team or with an advisor and discuss, well, what are the key risks that the business face and what do they want to protect against and then decide accordingly. Ideally, they're going to have a bit of everything, but that would depend on budget. So you often see big companies like, I don't know, Thomas Cook collapsing. Is there something they could have done business protection-wise to protect themselves? Well, I don't know what's happened within the business, but I imagine my understanding that it's just been badly run and been unprofitable. That's different. Okay, If a business is badly run and it's unprofitable, then it goes bust. Yeah, You can't protect against that apart from having good people in place to run it. Okay. So you, people are an important asset, but the company still has to be well run. Correct. Yeah. So you recently attended the Money Fax Awards. That's right, yeah. Tell me, what are they? They are, uh, it was the Money Fax Investment Life and Pensions 2019 Awards. Uh, so you were nominated? We were nominated. We were finalists for two awards. Yeah. The Tax and Estate Planner of the Year. Yeah. And the Protection Advisor of the Year. Before you tell me the results... I think this is always important. Who was a presenter? Because often there's a celebrity name. Mira Sayal. Ah. CBE. CBE. She's an actress. She Com- is. Comedian. Best known for Goodness Gracious Me yeah. and the Kumars. Yeah. Was she good? Yeah, she was all right, actually. Yeah, yeah. she was quite amusing. Good. What'd you eat? I had... I don't know, actually. I've got, I might have the menu. <laughs> Do you want to know? I, I think entertainment and food is always important in awards. Mainly because I never win them, so... Okay, I'll tell you exactly what I have. I had the vegetarian menu, okay. which was heritage beetroot and goat's curd to start, which was actually delicious. Okay. Anything with the word curd in puts me off, but it was <laughs> delicious. Main course was stuffed spiced aubergine with jumbo couscous, wow. korma sauce, tempura shallots, yeah. pomegranate and mint yogurt. Yeah. Delicious. And dessert, I had orange amaretto and manjari sphere, which was also delicious. For the carnivals out there, yeah. It was smoked duck breast with duck croquet. How do you pronounce that word? Croquet. Croquet. Pea puree and cherry gel. Okay. Main course was carved beef fillets, mm. thyme baked carrots, parmentia potatoes, and broad beans. Okay. Yeah, it was a good meal. Where was it? The Hilton Park Lane, London. Lovely. So let's get to a nitty gritty. Who won? We didn't win anything for the Protection Advisor of the Year Award, no. but we were commended for the tax and estate planner of the year. So we got a nice trophy and a nice certificate oh, wow. for that. Congratulations. Thank you. And we had a nice photo with Mira. Yeah. And uh, there's actually a picture, which will probably be up on our social media, mm. um, which I just happened to make a laugh at the time they were taking the photo. Did you tickle her? I didn't, I didn't tickle her. I said to her, I was a big fan of goodness gracious me when I was growing up. I said, no, we've got this, uh, we may have won this small trophy. I said, but how big is this dunder? <laughs> which was one of the lines in the show. Do you remember that? Yeah. And she laughed at that it's comment. It's good that you was... thought of that on the spot. Well, well you know did me. you have that at the back of your mind? In no, because you... I didn't know we were going to win and I didn't know she was presenting. That's um, witty. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. Uh, so that was good. So this was our final episode on protection in this series. That's sad. Ah, oh. But I'm sure we'll talk about it a bit more in the future. So if you've enjoyed this series or any of the podcasts so far, please do leave us a review wherever you're listening, but online. Don't just say it out loud because we won't know. So you can do it on Apple Podcasts, Podbean, on our Facebook group, and also our YouTube page. And also send us messages on Twitter at InforAPennyPod1. Be nice. So. Shall I tell you a bit about who's, who is listening and interacting? Go on, who's listening and interacting? So previously we've spoken about our global reach. And we have... I think we're mainly UK listeners though, aren't we yeah we've got a good what is it about 75 percent uk about 75 percent uk have we hit any new countries over the last we have. few episodes we are popular in thailand ah. people resting on the beach listening to... okay i don't know what that means it's what they say in thailand i believe it means hello okay. unless people were swearing at me when i went to thailand i think it means hello i imagine people are sitting on the beaches of thailand listening to the in for a penny podcast finding out all they can about mortgages, protection, and the world of personal finance. <laughs> also, we have listeners in Hong Kong and closer to Europe, Sweden. No, actually that's actually in Europe. in Europe. Yeah, they've moved it. <laughs> <laughs> so 
it's quite big in Scandinavia. Sweden, Norway. Is Norway in Scandinavia? Yeah. Yeah. But big in Scandinavia. Sweden, Norway. Oh, I can see some listeners in Mexico, India. We're getting everywhere. Good. Let's keep it up. And that's all we have time for. Please remember, anything discussed in this program should not be viewed as financial advice. But if you do need support, please contact me at mark, M-A-R-C, at cavendishcontent.com or visit the Orchard Practice website at www.topfs.co.uk. You can also find us on Twitter at InforAPennyPod1, at Mark Schoffman and at Josh Gersler. If you'd like to leave us feedback, there's a link in the show notes telling you how to do that. We really appreciate any comments you provide. And do post any financial issues you'd like us to cover. Thank you for being in for a penny.